said to me, he goes, Brandon, I'm going to tell you one thing. And this was probably the best advice I was ever given. It's going to take you three years before you're accepted as a local. Once you cross three years, you'll start to see the difference in it and things will break. It'll get better. If you don't make it for the three years, you won't make it. But give it to three years, you'll see a difference. Three years to the day, there was a noticeable difference. He's James Collins. He is Alec Cranston. And this is the Matter Matter of Facts Facts Podcast. Podcast. The Matter of Facts Podcast brings you the unsung heroes, the unsung stories, news and happenings from across our wonderful city that you maybe thought happened but didn't quite know the truth behind. And get you all in the loop on what's going on, what's to come, and what can we be prepared for. Welcome to Season 3 of Matter of Facts. We are on Episode 1 of Season 3. What a journey it's been. What What a journey journey it's been. What a journey it's been. They have allowed us back for a third season. Thank you. People are asking about it. So I think things are going pretty well, considering this was a random idea that we had a couple of years ago. It's And it's evolved. We've changed things over the last couple of seasons. We have new stuff coming for you guys this season. We've had some incredible guests. We have. Uh, we have more lined up for this season, including today's guest, who is a great guy. Very look, very much looking forward to talking to him. And uh, a lot more fun stuff on the way. We're going to keep some stuff that we've been doing in terms of segments, but we got, we're got we going to shake some stuff up. Every season, yeah. we shake it up a little bit. You know, there's always something that doesn't exactly work the way we want it to, but we find something new and we play with it a little bit. We have finished playing with it a little bit, and we should dive straight in. Do you want to just go straight in on season three? Let's just let's dive. Go straight right into insane, insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. Insane is the crane. Kinda insane like the crane. Now bear insane with us the for this one because there is a bear with us for this one. Yes. Um, today we are talking about a rather strange incident, and we come with props as well. We do. Our special um, guest, who? L- Linda. Uh, Linda. Yeah. So we were coming into the studio today and we forgot they have a massive cardboard bear, which we will now display for you. There's Linda. Say hello, Linda. Hello, Linda. Uh, What type type of bear is Linda? Is that a grizzly grizzly grizzly? bear? This might might be a grizzly bear. Survey says grizzly. Survey says grizzly. Okay, this is Linda. uh, And this was really perfect, perfect context for today because we're talking about one of the biggest stories in HRM the last couple of weeks, which is the bear that was stuck in a tree at Dartmouth Common. Yes. Do you want the rundown bear. of the story or do you want you want to do it? Yeah. So it was like, this was, uh, I think, this past week, Thursday afternoon, uh, a young black bear uh, made its way into a park located between a bunch of busy streets in Dartmouth. Uh, it was spotted around 5 a.m. near Sullivan's Pond. So just kind of right downtown. Is Dartmouth that a bear area. out there, darling? As I wipe my eyes in the morning, get I rid of the sleep. I can't be this. Uh, what a day ahead. There's a bear. There's a bear over there. Oh my gosh! So I guess what what was said by uh, what's it where does where it go by Butch Galvez, who is a wildlife technician with the Department of Natural Resources, spotted near Sullivan's Pond at 5 a.m. and then uh, about an hour later located at the Dartmouth Commons, and then people spotted it clinging to a tree around 11 a.m. Galvez said that black bears sort of follow their nose, and a young male like this at this time of year are kind of in super eating mode, so they'll wander looking for food. So through the night, the bear made it into an area, and once the traffic got busy, the bear went up for a tree for safety. And so they wanted to make sure the bear wasn't a threat to the public, and they wanted to start uh, the process of rescuing the bear, right? They don't want to have to do anything you know, inhumane or whatever, so they placed crash pads under the tree where it was hiding. That must have been a tough fall, Linda. And uh, the bear fell down, and they immobilized it. The video, you can see video online of Linda the bear uh, making this heroic fall. It looks like the firefighters and DNR and the cops are holding, looks like mattresses. But here's the thing, you've got to go and watch that video, because what I noticed when I watched it, as the bear starts to fall, the dudes holding the crash pads, they take off running. (laughs) And I don't, I, th- I think the goal, now it's easier said than done because I didn't have to hold uh, a crash pad as, as, a, as a one ton bear came down, 2,000 pound bear came down on me. Um, but if you watch <laughs> it really carefully and slow it down, you see the dudes take off the second the bear starts falling. But, you know, a couple of things. Um, good on the public for reporting it. Good on the on DNR and the cops for keeping the public safe, closing the schools. Really pleased that they tranquilized it and didn't shoot it. Yeah. And then the story ends. You can see the photo online um, when they put it in this, looks like a barrel on its side. I'm assuming it's a bear catcher. I don't know what you call them. A bear catcher? B- b- it's French. It's Bacotia. 
they put them in a bekosha and then they uh, then they released it and there's a little thing of the bear who we've now called Linda running off. Yeah. The funniest line was, in my opinion, the tagline, bear returned to nature after taste of Dartmouth urban living. Hmm. Okay. I thought One of good. our new migrants. <laughs> that was good. That was good. I enjoyed that. But that's the insane as the crane. Uh, did you hear the quote from the bear as well, though? No. Oh, bears don't speak English. Sorry. Oh, you got me there, buddy. Well, we're glad you're safe and sound. We're glad you're back in the wild. Um, I'm sorry you didn't like Dartmouth as much as we hoped you would or the Dartmouth that I've been living from somebody that lives in Dartmouth. Um, however, happy trails, Mr. Bear. It's probably time that we say goodbye to Reddit Roundup. Oh. We were very grateful for its service to the podcast. Two years. Um, two we years, but two I think seasons. we do need to move on. So before we go any further, we, um, we, we should probably pay our respects to Reddit Roundup properly. Cue music. I didn't know what to say, so I googled eulogies, and somebody else's came up. So I figured I'd just read Let's the first it. few lines. Let's so hear it. in respect, okay, we all bow our heads. We gathered here today in memory of our dear colleague Reddit Roundup. When we heard that he was no more, we were both shocked and saddened. Death has taken away a genuinely warm individual. More importantly, a loving husband and father, and deprived so many others, including us all, of a good friend. While we mourn the loss of a colleague, we pay tribute and celebrate a life that was well lived. A life committed to the cause of freedom in his own country, and when liberty came, to building harmony and peace around the world. Not many leave behind a legacy of such dedication and accomplishment. Thank you, Reddit Roundup. That was beautiful. Right, screw that. On to the next thing. So, uh, oh, Reddit right, Roundup, you'll be so missed. Uh, are you that emotional? No. Goodbye, Reddit Roundup. Good yeah, riddance, good riddance. Good riddance. It was See good you later. fun. Uh, so we are replacing it with a, a new segment with a new jingle. So I'm going to introduce, and then you can tell me what you think of the jingle, our new segment called Harbor of Lies. Harbor of Lies. Harbor of Lies. <laughs> What we're going to do on Harbor of Lies is play a little game. You fancy a game? I would fancy a game. Game begin. Every month, we're going to take it in turns. One of us is going to tell the other one a fact, a story about Halifax. And it's either going to be utter BS or 100% true. And the other person has to question them and try to dig to the bottom of the facts. Uh, and then they're going to make the a, the matter of facts. Then they're going to make a decision on whether or not that thing is real or whether that thing exists in the harbor of lies. Okay. To keep it easy for Alec, I said, I'll, I'll do the first one. So I'm going to give you a statement, which I claim to be true. And then it's up to you to ask me questions, get context, hear the story to pieces if you want to, um, and then make a determination on whether or not it is true. And, and the goal here is that we kind of choose quirky things, whether true or not. To make, We're not going to say sort of like the McDonald Bridge is green or, you know, Batman lives in... We're, we're going to tell things that live in this weird gray area. Okay. So so here is my declaration on the inaugural Harbor of Lies. I get 10 questions, lies. right? I get 10 questions. 10 questions. 10 questions. Uh, I will count them. So this is our, this is my declaration, which I claim to be true, which is underneath the parking lot for the Barrington Street Superstore, there is a buried elephant. Underneath the parking lot for the Barrington Street Superstore, there is a buried elephant. An elephant is buried under that parking lot. So your first question, just as we sort of work through this first harbor of lies, you probably want a little bit of context, do you? A little bit more on that story, why I claim that's true? Sure. So you're ask me, ask, it. Ask me oh, the question. I thought you were offering it up. Yeah, um, I will if you ask me. You ask me, Alec, I'll give you anything. Okay, okay. Um, so it's buried under the parking lot. So it's buried under the parking lot, not under the actual building itself. In that area, yeah. In that area. Uh, on the parking lot, essentially. This is the, this is the facts that I claim to have. Okay. Is it buried closer to the gas station or closer to Via Rail? Uh, I do not know. You don't know. But there is a backstory if you want to ask me about that. What year was it buried? It was buried in 1923, and I'll give you a little bit of context here as to why. The elephant was called Tuscus, and it was buried in 1923 when the Carson and Barnes uh, Circus was in Halifax. When that circus visited town, they obviously back then, which I disagree with, had elephants. They were here for a couple of nights, and one of the elephants got sick. Because it died, they determined that the best thing to do 
was to bury it in Halifax. They weren't able to push it into the harbour, they couldn't burn it. So this is why it makes total sense, is because the elephant died touring with the Carson and Barnes Circus in 1923, and the only thing you can do with a five-ton elephant is bury it. Um, and because they were down near the rail yards, and the rail yards were being dug up at that time, they managed to dig a hole. Uh, and they buried that elephant, which to this day is there. And in the 80s, when they relayed that parking lot, people came across bones, but because there was ivory under there, the city sort of turned a blind eye to it and didn't really want to get involved because um, they felt it was easier to just sort of not officially acknowledge it. Uh, oh. And that was the last time that Tuskus the elephant was was spotted, was, uh, was when the parking lot was being done in the 80s. Do they do anything to commemorate it at all? Not that I am aware of. Is there anything in the parking lot that would show that here lies Tuscus? Nothing. Uh, And it comes down to the fact that the city were very keen to not really acknowledge this when people spotted bones. No, fair enough. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, It's it's almost like it's such a ridiculous story. Mm. But it's, it's believable if they were digging up at the time this was in the 20s you said in the 20s and part of the reason they buried it as quickly as they did was news didn't travel as fast in the 20s it wasn't as if like halifax reddit was was going to find this uh, and photograph it oh okay and i'm reading my my notes here there um there is apparently a photo of it which was tight ty- which was taken there's the a next- photo of it there's a photo fo- you can't you're not allowed to google anything for the game but i think you're really pulling my leg by saying there's a photo of it you're making me there were lots of cameras in the 20s and this would have just been like a railway worker or someone um but i i don't think the photo's published i'm just looking at my notes here i just think there is a f- that somebody claims they have a photo of it somebody claims they have a photo somebody of claims it. they have a photo of it okay um did you say how did you say how big the elephant was was it like a full grown adult that's all i know was it was um an exotic animal that. There was a zoo, like there was. So you're thinking of the what was that thing called that used to be on McNabb's Island? Oh, that's different. I'm thinking of one that used to be in. Uh, uh, this I, I won't bring this up because I'm going to use this on one of our next versions of this. But the Bill Lynch Show. So every year, the Bill Lynch Show is one of the biggest carnivals ever in the '40s. Used to go to mm-hmm. McNabb's Island for a couple of weeks every year. So Halifax has a long history of hosting circuses. Okay. And supposedly, an elephant called Tuskis who died and was buried under the Superstore parking lot. And who approved that? You, you can't just come to town and bury an elephant. Says uh, they arranged to bury Tuskis right uh, close to where the circus is set up camp, which was an open lot near the old railway station on Barrington Street. City officials wanted to avoid negative press, so arranged for it to happen quickly, uh, and the story never really made it into the newspapers. So that's at huh. the time, yeah. That, that, that's what my notes say. What's your source? Where'd you find this? Where'd you find this information? My source was Googling weird stories about Halifax and then finding this and then not being able to find much on it until I Googled really, really deeply and found it. Really, really deep. And using the elephant's name Tuskis was the best way to find information on it. <sighs> What'd they do with the ivory? Uh, nothing, because when the ivory was, you know, back in the 20s, you could do whatever you wanted with ivory. Back in the day, uh, the story goes in the 80s when they redug and relayed the parking lot uh, for that superstore. Um, they didn't want to acknowledge the ivory because it would get the city into a load of hot water. So they never really did anything to acknowledge that uh, that was okay. the thing. That's okay, so, so here's the question, and I'm going to ask it again. I claim... That in 1923, an elephant called Tuskis, which was part of the Carson and Barnes Circus, was buried under and still is under the Superstore parking lot. Is that the truth or does it exist in the Harbour of Lies? It exists in the Harbour of Lies. It exists in the Harbour of Lies. I'm going to throw this to Connor, our producer here as well, because I want his opinion. Okay, what do you think, Connor? For the sake of uh, controversy and conversation, I'm going to say... They buried an elephant there. You think they buried an elephant there? I'm saying they buried an elephant there. Okay. So Alec claims it exists in the Harbor of Lies. Yep. And the answer is... It exists in the Harbor of Lies. Come on! Well Woo! done, what a well start. done. What a start. I just, you're very, you're a very good storyteller. And it was a very, it was very good. I just, what was, I, mean, I guess one thing we could do is what made me think you weren't telling the truth. Yeah, go for it. And you just kept saying this. I look at my notes here. If I look at my notes, like you just, you seem like you had so much on it. And I bet you were looking at nothing. You actually created a, <laughs> there's oh a story. Oh <laughs> my God. You create a whole story. There is this. a story. Now, is it true or not? No, we've established it's bullshit. Wow. Interesting. Well, you, you can know keep that as a souvenir. You know what's funny? I said it wasn't true, but I was hoping it would have been. I was hope because then I want to be able to tell people that uh, that it is because I have another. St- 
Oh no! Oh, you you are next on Harbor. Yeah. Lies. Oh man, I have some. Good, but the problem is, like, you know a lot of weird facts about Halifax. So, like, I have one for next next episode. I just I mean, you might already know the answer, but we're gonna find out. We're gonna find out. Okay, let's get our guest in. Let's do it. So we wanted to kick off season three with a bang and a drink. First of all, cheers, everyone. We'll, we'll cheers. tell you who we all are in a minute. Cheers to cheers. season three. Yes. Welcome, Brandon. This is Thank Brandon you. Bird. See, I should have a, a sip first. Excuse me. Mm. Excuse yeah, my rudeness That's bad here. form. Yeah. About, th- th- this is a podcast, so you have to do everything so people can imagine it. So I'll do an, a really loud sip in the mic. You ready? There you go. If you're not all grossed out, Ooh, um, welcome that. back to the podcast. Brandon Bird is the CEO of Bird Mechanical. We will we will call them a company out of Newmarket, Ontario. Brandon is a client of mine, and we wanted to have him on the podcast for a very interesting reason, and that is they have recently historically won the, the largest project, $84 million, right? 74. 74. Add another 10, why not? Okay, <laughs> 74, yeah. Well, since when was I want to embellish a story? Um, in the company's history in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and they are an Ontario-based company. And what we see a lot of, which we'll all admit as Maritimers, is in order to win large chunks of work, a lot of our companies have to turn away from the Maritimes and, and expand elsewhere. Brandon, uh, his company in Bird Mechanical have kind of done the opposite. So we thought with Brandon becoming very ingrained in Nova Scotia, buying property here and kind of almost starting to live here as often as he can, this was going to form a wonderful conversation about how great our city is. Welcome, Brandon. That was a great introduction. Pretty good. Eh? And, I, and you pumped me up with Thank an extra 10 million. Thank you for joining us and join us next time on Matter of Fact. No. That's the first time he hasn't used Chad GPT for an intro, too. Oh, that was really good. screw you. So, ah, come on now. There's hope for the old guy. <laughs> oh, geez. So, Brandon, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, give us a quick history on the company and then sort of your, uh, your journey to becoming an adoptee of Nova Scotia. So the company was founded in 1971 by my grandfather. I'm a third generation plumber. My father joined the company, I guess, probably what, mid 1970s. And basically, my father took over from my grandfather in their early 90s during the recession. Um, the company started primarily like residential, light commercial plumbing, all the boring stuff um, that we try not to do today. And um, my dad took over in the early 90s, right, right in the recession, 92, 93 kind of thing. Um, changed it because everybody can change a toilet and all these all the simple things. Wanted to get into more complex mechanical systems, change it up a bit. Um, so he kind of got into that and started really growing the business over the years. And then fast forward a whole bunch of years, I graduated high school and I said, I want nothing to do with this business, so I'm going to go to film school. Right? Here we go. Let's not do And this. clearly where you ended up. Yeah, absolutely. Here I am in a podcast studio. There you go. Full circle <laughs> moment. Wor- worked really well. Um, so I actually went to film school because I was determined. I did work like high school summers, everything. I was around the business my whole life. Grade nine, I think um, at the time, my dad landed our largest job at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. I think it was about 7.7 million. So every weekend in grade nine, I spent working at the hospital. So I've been around it my whole life. And I said, okay, I'm going to go do something else. Everyone's like, you're crazy. Why would you do that? And I'm like, no, I'm going over here. So I um, went, did that fun stuff, did some music videos for Sam Roberts Band, a lot of corporate stuff, all the boring stuff, the weddings, you know, everything to pay the bills, a bunch of short films. And then um, graduated and didn't have a job. And my father's like, yeah, you're coming to work. (laughs) Yeah, you're done school, so you're coming to work. If I give you the job, we have a very stringent interview process and application process and you might not make the grade I, were you treated like any i other probably applicant? didn't make the grade it's okay <laughs> I'm, so, all, I'm all in favor of nepotism by the way let me just put that on the record <laughs> it's a good thing so i went in and i was staying for six months they needed help in, in the back i'm setting up a tool crib getting a fab shop going i said okay i'll stay for six months and i'm leaving and uh, that was in january 2008 we are in 2024 i never left and somehow I'm running the company now. So I don't know what happened <laughs> between 2008 Don't ask and that. questions. That's no. a good trajectory. I'd be very proud of that. Yes. Um, went, got my plumbing license, became a Red Seal plumber um, over the years. So in 2012, I became a licensed plumber, um, worked my way up in the company, and eventually uh, 2016 took over. My father retired in 2018 officially. And here we are. And then somewhere in between there, I had this great idea like, all right, let's do something different. Let's put my own mark on this company. Let's go to another province. Yeah, I'm surprised they still have hair. <laughs> I, I don't know how I didn't pull it all out after that. And that's how we ended up here in Nova Scotia. That was the 
And it was uh, something I was determined to make work, obviously. It's a very tough market to come into. But that was the goal. I really wanted to kind of put my own mark on the company, do something different. We'd never, we'd done some out-of-province work, some work down in the U.S. and a few things, but never really been, had an office set up and, and permanently set up somewhere else. So Nova Scotia, that's when I met James. So what was your what was your pull to Nova Scotia? You said you wanted to decide to make your mark and go to a different province. What was the, what brought you here, I should say? So we actually had an employee that worked for us for a few years in Ontario and decided they were fed up with the Ontario lifestyle and wow. we're going to move out here. Um, not to, the only reason they were leaving us was to come out here. They were doing the Irving shipyard at the time. Right. So we got a job uh, out here. He moved him and his family out here. And then after a few years of being out here, he uh, got frustrated knew what it could be like to work for a company out here, saw where they were missing some of the marks. So he called me, we were actually coming out uh, in 2018 for his wedding. So he called me up and said, you know, would you consider when you're coming out here, would you consider putting an office out here? And I was like, that's so crazy. Why would I do that? Oh, what was your opinion of Nova Scotia at the time? I honestly had never even been to Nova Scotia at the time. Oh, okay. really? Okay. At the point when the conversation started, I'd never been so out come here. come for the wedding was the first time. That was the, my very first yeah. time in Nova Scotia. That was the first time. Um, came out, love it. We went, did the the wedding was up in Debert, stayed up in Tatamagooch, uh, Wallace by the Sea, in an Airbnb, mm-hmm. lovely spot. And then we went down to Lunenburg, made a bit of a trip. And then on our last day, we left a little early so we could spend some time downtown Halifax. Oh, you saw all the nice spots. That's great. And saw that. So it was a, it was like a whirlwind f- three or four days. Yeah. But it was a really nice trip, and that was the first time. So that kind of started the conversation. And then I think in August or September. Um, Ray, who's my EVP now, executive mm-hmm. vice president, he was uh, one of our VPs at the time, came out with me, and we kind of did a recon mission, just learning about the market, what's it like, what kind of work is available out here, is it viable, do we think we can sustain a business out here, and after doing spending a bit of time talking to suppliers, going around, we said, okay, we think we can do something here, and the goal at the time was if we could get a, a business division that could maybe do between three and five million a year, we should have a viable option and this should be good. So that was kind of what we set out to do. And uh, little did I know that it was going to be three years of hell coming up <laughs> when we said, let's do this. I definitely yeah. kind of underestimated it. So I took over a business, 50-year-old business, essentially, yeah. I took over. And you take for granted the little things like how um, the reputation, everything you've built up and the impact that has and how much easier it makes it to do to get work because you have that reputation, that history, these projects behind you. Mm-hmm. Come here, meant nothing. Yeah. So you come in, um, you reckon you do three to five million a year, pandemonium all hell breaks loose in a good way. So was this before or after we got over the three-year hurdle? <laughs> the first three years? <laughs> the first brutal. three years. You could, <laughs> I couldn't buy a job here. Nobody would give you a job. You're not from here. We go to right. interviews, you'd be, you'd be low bid on a job and they look at you and go, nope. I had one client, we literally, I flew out the night before. They said, we want to have a meeting. I said, okay, no problem, I'll fly out. So I got on a plane. I called my wife. I said, I'm not coming home. Get on a plane. I got to go out to Nova Scotia for she an interview. She said, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was like, very, very nice. Yeah. She's upset. I, I fly home later tonight. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I literally get, a, f- get on a plane, fly out here for this interview, and they're going through the job. And I'm like, yep, here's a bigger version of this job we've done. And the person running our office at the time, I said, That'll be their project manager. He actually did this big version in Toronto. He's been out here for a few years. And they go, that's really good. And the guy goes, like, this is impressive. I'm impressed that you have this kind of work under your belt. But, you know, you just you haven't done it out here. I look at him. I go, is your pipe different than mine? Like, no, is your square? the center of the universe. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, clearly. Like, maybe you guys have square pipe or something. Something crazy I haven't seen. Because it's not like Nova Scotia is like a, a decade behind where we are. So mm-hmm. it's okay. So I'm like, oh, is your pipe different? He goes, no. Oh, so I'm like, so why can't I do the job then? I'm a plumber. My license says I'm good anywhere. And he goes, you're not, you're not from here. And I go, I wasn't here yesterday at noon when you asked for this meeting either, but here I am. Yeah. And it wasn't a big job. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, I wasn't here yesterday, but I got on a plane and I flew out here. If that doesn't show you my level of commitment Mm -hmm. to to executing a project and looking after this, I, I, I don't know what does. And the guy goes, that's actually a really good answer. I still didn't get the job. Ah, <laughs> that's a good answer. Did you invoice them the six hundred dollar, or you would have flown first class the eighteen hundred dollars <laughs> for the flight to Toronto? No, and I think um, the, the the question I have off the back of this is 
you know, we, we're aware here in Nova Scotia that we're sort of charmingly insular is probably the best way I can put it. The point of this conversation is we want to talk to somebody who's who's come into our market and now has has seen the Nova Scotia market form uh, the the main focus of their business. How did you actually transition to going? Hey, not only is Nova Scotia a good place to set up, you know, a, a small side operation of our operation, but but it's going to form a major part of of our. Well, the major part planning. we didn't know at the time. Um, it ended up happening. That was that was timing and a bit of luck. So in 2018, I came out here and I had one really good lunch. And I think if I didn't have this lunch with an individual um, from out here, from one of the general contractors out here, and he said to me, he goes, Brandon, I'm going to tell you one thing. And this was probably the best advice I was ever given. It's going to take you three years before you're accepted as a local. And the first three years are going to suck. And it doesn't matter what you do. You're going to lose business and you're not going to get it because you're not from here. You're going to be the out-of-towner. Once you cross three years you'll start to see the difference and and things will break. It'll get better. There's a chance, but you have to stick it out three years. If you don't make it for the three years, you won't make it. But give it to three years, you'll see a difference. Three years to the day, there was a noticeable difference. But Mm -hmm. the first three years was a lot of money being dumped out here, trying to get through it, get over those hurdles, um, trying to get work, convince people that you're committed, that you know how to install the same pipe that you install in Ontario. Um, Once we got over those hurdles, though. They are standard fittings, right? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Is it similar out there? I mean, much, much bigger, bigger cities, but like if a company from Nova Scotia expanded out to where you guys were and that was your, that was your home, home base, are people treating them the same way in in terms when they first get there in terms of, well, you're not from around here? I think you'd have a shot at getting in. Um, You're going to have the the hard part, I think, is always getting established, getting people that don't want to work for you. Yeah. Like that was the other hurdle that you don't think of is people look at you and go, well, you're not from here. You're new here. If I come work for you, like, am I going to have a job in six months? Or are you just here for one job and then you're right. leaving? So that took a little while yeah. uh, to kind of get that, where, get over that hurdle where people are like, okay, th- these guys aren't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. We're not afraid. There were some great people that are still with us today oh, yeah. that took that leap of faith. Yeah. Um, but it was definitely hard to attract talent at the beginning. And I think you might have that issue as a startup anywhere you go. Yeah. But I think getting accceptance for doing the work uh, in Toronto, you, I think you'd, it'd be easier in that aspect. And so do you yourself, do you live, you still live in Ontario now? Yeah, north of the city, not actually in the city. I not would go crazy if I lived in the city. You yeah. just say Toronto because no, most people don't know the small town where I'm from. Yeah, yeah. No, where are you from? Uxbridge. Uxbridge. No, I don't know the name. Exactly. Of course. There you go. <laughs> I hope I have family out in Ontario, but I do not know the name. Um, and I don't know if you mentioned, were you considering ever moving to Nova Scotia at some point? I would love to move to Nova yeah. Scotia if I could. Um, your income tax makes mm. me go, no, oh. no. And you know, CRA will treat wherever you live on December 31st as your income tax for the whole December 31st year. every year, I'll move back to Ontario. That's what you should there do. You yeah. Uh, tax and, loophole and advice with Brandon. Your, um, I want to get to your kind of big project here in Nova Scotia. But before we do that, you know, personally, we're all about the humans on this show, uh, the humans that are drinking uh, among us. And so you you bought a place here in Halifax. Um, some rock star gave you a, a referral to a really good residential realtor. You can thank him in a second. Uh, and thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I no, you're good. That. You're welcome, I appreciate Brandon. that. <laughs> and thank you've you. recently bought property in Cape Breton. Um, talk a little bit, you know, away from the business for a minute about being adopted as a Nova Scotian because Brandon and I a couple of um, weeks ago had a really interesting call where you were at a um, what would we call it the, tra- the training course? training course I suppose yeah. and he was pretty much adopted as a Nova Scotian by those from Nova Scotia who gone out to do this course in Ontario it's kind of a weird thing there's people from all over Canada there, but there's a good group turf, from Nova Scotia like home turf in yeah. Ontario and, and the Nova Scotians adopt you so tell us a little bit personally about you know what it's like to get adopted as a de facto Nova Scotian and then I want to talk about your um your big project, uh, and uh, I want to touch on the non-resident provincial 5% uh, detransfer tax. We'll, we'll hold that, though, until after this. So personally, let t- tell us what it's like to get adopted by us. So that was interesting, and I thought that was an interesting point when I was at this training course at um, the Ivy School for Business at Western University. Um, there was people from all over Canada for this leadership course uh, that's focused on people running businesses, CEOs, and that uh, called Quantum Shift they put on. So I got into the program. Uh, one week, you go live on campus on site, um, do a whole week worth of courses. They put you in class from like 8 a.m. to 8, no, 10 wow. p.m. The one day was 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. It was wild. Um, it's an intense week. And I got to the point where a few people finally asked me, did they misprint your name tag? And I go, what do you What do you mean? No, my name's spelled right. And they go, well, it says you're from Ontario. 
yeah, I am. And they go, but you're always with the Nova Scotians and you seem to know a lot about Halifax and all that. I'm like, yeah. And that, so why does it say Ontario? Because I live in Ontario. I'm like, but you, I'm like, I spend a lot of time in Halifax. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it, and it was funny because uh, it, it just from you, the little things you know when you spend a lot of time here that people would take for granted. Understanding, you know, streets or places and restaurants and the different events and things that happen. So when you, when I was talking to some of the people and go, oh yeah, like, you know, go into a Mooseheads game or, you know, you you know, going down to Bicycle Thief or any of the restaurants and you get talking about the different things, walking around Point Pleasant Park, uh, you know, East Coast Lifestyle, all those things. And and they, so they, they kind of like, well, you, you know a lot about Halifax. I'm like, well, I'm kind of there every month. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of become a second home. And if we can, my wife and I try to spend weekends out here, long weekends, extend nice. trips, work trips. And any, anytime we can be here, I, I try to be here as much as I can. Um, so it was interesting to see that you could hit it off with people just by knowing a lot and just the things, you know, from being like, almost like a local here, I, yeah. I tell everybody I'm like a, I'm a semi-local now. A semi-local. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's so, what, cause you go into restaurants and people, they get to the servers, staff, they get to know you and they go, so you, so you like, you live around here. I'm like, no. Any no. spots you like the most, like since you've been coming here, like talking about restaurants and like, obviously we all like to have a good drink. Drink. Like, I, say, I oh, don't drink. But, uh, come on now. Just, this is rural this is Wisconsin. I don't drink. I'm not good taking a second swig. It's fine. No, no. First of all, before I get to my, am I going to get, do I get, get invited the next time you guys are going on a drink fest or you guys are out climbing oh, dogs? Like, just the, la- the last one was pretty wild. I, I, let me put I it this way. It. I, I said to my wife, I'm going for a quick drink with Brandon, a quick burn on Pete's boat. Uh, and I'll probably be back for dinner. And we left w- at one a.m. We Facetimed yeah. her at one a.m. She was in bed. I was like, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was pretty wild. I, no, I, I, oh, you're, you're invited. I oh, can yeah. handle it. I just, I just actually yesterday got back from my four day bachelor trip. I so I recognize I can handle it still. I can still go. You can still. Where'd you go? Wheels fall off. So we didn't. We went local. We went to White Point down in uh, Lunenburg, Liverpool area. Yeah. Boys got a big waterfront cottage, and we went to the Shore Club, which was unreal on Saturday night. But we, you know, we parted at the house the other nights and went to the main lodge. And my buddy uh, brought his smoker, so every night was something different. It was jalapeno poppers, wings, ribs, amazing, it was wow, crazy. They had a hot tub, and the, the house was big. There was eleven of us um, because we're getting married, but we're going away, so we're going to Dominican for that. So they kept it local for the bachelor party. I'm still recovering. Like this, this is hard. Like I, I when James called me yesterday, I was like. Yeah, we're gonna have a drink for the podcast. I think I gagged a little bit because I just. Yeah. You said I will never drink again. We had we Bull had. I said that last night, and here Bull I am. Shit. I know we had like over. Uh, I think it was like four hundred cans of, of of booze and bought and, and then some bottles, and it was all gone. And then we get anyways. Proud uh, of you. Yeah, no, it went well. No, it went well, and I'm all right. Um, but I was gonna back to my question. Sorry, I went on a tangent for my party there, but. Just gave um, me a chance to have a drink. It's exactly. Uh, it's just, where, where do you like going for a pint when you're here? What do we say is your, your go-to spots? Huh. One of the nice things about having a place here is you can just have a pint at home now. That's beautiful. Right? Yeah. That's, it's, it sounds silly, but when you, no, spend, I agree. when you spend a lot of time uh, doing the hotel traveling thing, actually having a place here, like I leave clothes here. I can literally, that backpack I came in with, That's I I just travel with that. Yeah. So it's it's nice. So that's probably one of the nicest, as, as silly as it is, um, things to say is, is just, that's a good answer. Being able to have one at home. That's a good and not answer. Have, you don't have to go out all the time. I know. Where hotel is like the last thing you want to do is be in the room. So you're out until you're like, okay, I'm going to fall asleep now. Yeah. And but you're, you're in a good spot in the north end anyway yes. that if you do need to get downtown. Yeah, now that you mixed. guys actually have Uber. Now that, that we helps. actually have Uber. Mm-hmm. I think I drove you home last time we got together. So yes. I'll, I'll be you did not Uber. have that much to drink, at least, so that you were a responsible person. I was a responsible driver. Dr- oh, yeah, so... so um, Uber driver Todd. Uber Todd. So I'll just give you the quick lowdown here very quickly. Uh, uh, Alex's dad is a running joke on this podcast. We call him Uber Todd. He Uber Todd? landed in Montreal. No, you tell the story. Yeah, no. So he was coming back from Montreal from a business trip, and he texted me before he got on the flight. He's like, hey, like I'm going to get home at like 1 a.m., What's my best bet to getting home? I was like, oh, book an Uber. He goes, oh, so the Ubers will just kind of be there. I'm like, well, no, you no. know, get off and, and and book the Uber when you get there. And because it was like it was actually later than one. It was like three a.m. He was getting home, and he lands and he tries to book. The, he, he gets out there and he's like, he, he texts me in the middle of the night. I was I was asleep. He's like, the Ubers aren't here. I was like, the next morning I said, did you end up booking one? He said, oh boy, let me call you. So it, <laughs> so he had never booked an Uber before, downloaded the app, went to book it. He's going through the process, and he was he's like, they're asking you weird questions. They were like, you know, date of birth, all this. And then they said, send a picture of your driver's license and the make and model of your car and all this stuff. And he was he like, he signed up to no drive. Sense. And then he got a call from them. 
<laughs> they called him and said, welcome to Uber. Like, you're our late newest driver. Congratulations. So instead of booking an Uber, he signed up for Uber. So now it's the running. Has he actually done? Did he ever actually No, he never did. Home? He never on the last I would have done it at that point. Podcast, we actually text him from a burner number. Um, trying to book and a car ride. we tried to book a, book a cab with him. He was good sport. He knew what we were doing. He played along. But So if you ever hear the podcast, we refer to Ubertard. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it is. Uh, that, that's that, good. That's Alex Dad. Um, I want to bring the tone down here to a more kind of a more serious tone with, with an appropriate sound effect, maybe. There we go. Um, for for the that moment, that was so, good. I thought that was my stomach. Wasn't that good? So they, yeah. the wonderful thing about this is they add all the stuff in later. So yeah, you just, just kind like, of point. And he's like, like, this he's giving is me thumbs up. The mating call of a strange bird, <laughs> and it, it magically appears for our listeners. Our oh, listeners I thought you just home. wanted me to talk there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I want to congratulate. It's great having you the last for, name bird. Like, yeah. <laughs> People are, you, t- people, are, you, are you bird construction? Are you bird stairs? You like we no. got a number of birds locally. I know? am a shareholder in bird construction. Oh, you because are because I got fed up with people asking me, if, uh, <laughs> "Do you own it's the same company?" No, no. So, so I said, "Screw it." Well, they're publicly traded, so why not yeah. go buy some shares? Yeah, good for right? you. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so congratulations to Bird uh, Bird uh, Mechanical. Oof, gotta make sure I get that right. It's okay, uh, but depending on when someone listens to this, if it's January, we're rebranding the company. It's going to be a different name anyway. So is this fine. true? Is this true? Well, it's happening. We'll, we'll Ooh, touch on you that heard in it here first. Our staff wow. don't even know yet. This is a scoop. Wow. This is a scoop. And they're all this going. Is a scoop. Is my job, bump, bump, is my bump. job safe? I can't. I can't say the company name <laughs> yet, but I can tell you we are renaming, rebranding, and shifting gears a little bit. Okay, very cool. Bird will still be in the name. Bird, Bird. Birdie Mechanical. Bird is the word. Big oh, bird. big this bird is ex- This Boom. is exciting stuff. So you won this seventy-four million dollar project, which is the the biggest in your company's history. So yep. you know that's for for us that's super interesting when a company from Ontario wins its largest project in Nova Scotia. Because typically the, the the news we see in all Nova Scotia every day is Nova Scotia company wins its largest ever contract in Ontario. Um, so I'd like you to touch on that, and then I I would like you to tell us. Uh, Brandon called me up a couple of weeks ago, and he said, "Hey, I'm I'm." I'm sort of got this gripe which i thought was more than valid um about the fact that he has to pay for a property he purchased in sydney in addition to the one and a half percent i don't know what they charge deed transfer tax an additional five percent non-resident levy deed transfer tax which i quite rightly felt uh you didn't you know, you, you shouldn't have paid. Um, so maybe tell us a bit about that project and then this little sort of tax thing afterwards because I think as this podcast, we're very casual, we're very friendly, but, we, you know, we, we, we want to wear some of this stuff too. I like it. All right, so the job. So yeah, we're like, let's just go do a big job four and a half hours away from our office. Why not? It's fun. Now, we, um, had, we've been up in Cape Breton since 2021, actually, during COVID. That, that, that's in a whole other story. You want to talk about running a business in Nova Scotia during COVID when you can't fly in? Oh, I'm For sure. 14 months, I couldn't actually come visit our office here. And I'm usually here at least once a month with our staff. 14 months, I couldn't get in until we landed that job up there. Now we had a critical health infrastructure job. And the that's training the and the training um, required for it allowed you to bring skilled workers in from out of province. So I qualified and I could actually I mean, come visit my office. Visit I, the, the government that you own. Yeah, I, we didn't own it yet. Oh, the condo came after this because yeah, that that all started. We were renting a a place up in um, in Bedford. We were renting a place there because the staff and hoteling wasn't making sense. Um, so while we were renting there, and then I ended up I stayed there a few times. I'm like, this is way better than hotel life. So then I was like, James, get me a get me a residential real estate agent because I need a place. Let's give a plug to Pete Clive. He did a wonderful job. He did solid dude. Not only did he take us out on his boat. He got me a wicked condo. Yeah, wicked six condo. Six foot eight. Oh, five, that's what it was. Oh, yeah. Five, yeah. I've heard good things. That's awesome. No, it was, oh, and you know, good. that that was weird. So we, we were out here, we toured some stuff, and he actually showed me the condo. We ended up doing that. Uh, it was in Ontario, so we did that over Zoom. Oh, very nice. Did uh, just walking through, and oh, yeah, and nice. he did a wicked job describing nice, what it was solid like. Dude. You never go wrong. Pete, Pizza Hoot. And I, literally, it was know. as sold. So I, I didn't see the thing until after we bought it. You know, other than the through the Zoom. Yeah, in the North End. Yep, yep. Right by Salvatore's Pizza. Amazing. Oh, really? Okay, by oh, Hydrastone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a two-minute walk. It's wonderful. Very no, it's nice. nice. Yes. It's a nice Very spot. Nice. Yes. So anyways, after that, yes, we got the we got the condo here. So we closed that in what, March of 22, and that was a game changer. Being able to leave clothes here, that like traveling was like next level. Love coming here. It's like having home. You, you don't have to go out if you don't want to go out. So it's nice. Um, so we've been up in Cape Breton since 2021. Finally got the exemption. I could come visit the staff. It was good. We moved some staff out to help do the big underground project for the early works infrastructure for Cape Breton Regional. And um, we've been up there. There's not a lot of companies up there doing work. 
Um, so we were fortunate enough, and, and it's true, everything they say, like they, they'll burn your vans if you come onto the island, so don't do it. Everybody <laughs> should stay on mainland. Um, it, it is limited. There's a limited work pool, limited amount of companies up there. So after we did the one job, we got we keep getting asked, we did, can you help us do some budgets um, to, to budget what this mechanical job is going to be? And then, hey, we really need you to bid some of this stuff because there's not a lot of people looking at this work. We want to try and make sure we're um, maximizing taxpayer value, multiple bids, because uh, leading up to that, some companies are, there's only one company up there for a certain trades. They're landing this work, um, and it happens in multiple trades, not just mechanical. So we, we want to try to make sure we got competitive numbers. So we decided, given knowing it, being up there doing some of the early work stuff, having some other little jobs on the go, maybe this makes sense. Let's take a look at it. So um, as I told our bonding company, I like to shatter expectations. So we said, let's, let's give it a go. Um, didn't think we'd be low on it, um, but we were. We were able to, to land it. It was uh, probably a year and a bit coming between budgets and waiting for it to come out, um, tender packages and that. And then it was a, a while to get awarded. Um, and I'll, I won't forget the day that it actually came out. And they posted the, the numbers finally for all the packages that closed. It took a little bit. It was right before the Canadian Open uh, in 2024 here in May and remember just just yeah just get someone comes running over to my office like they just posted the results and then you go look and then you scroll and you're like okay there's a number in our, oh shit <laughs> we're the low bid and it's like okay and there's another number there like oh hey you know that's pretty close and then you realize oh no that wasn't the that's the that's the electrical package you're actually half the price of of the local contractor. <laughs> they were 140 million and we were 74. It's Ooh. fine. It's good. Yeah. It's good. In the bag. It's just saved. Bang. I just I just saved you guys as taxpayer 70 70 million. Well, we appreciate You're welcome. It. Wow. You're welcome. Yeah, by you. To that. Yeah. I, I, I See, agree. and that's why they said please come bid this. Um, so historically large project, which is I would and, and in Ontario honestly if that that same job came out I wouldn't bid it. Really? We would, so our work structure is different in Ontario than it is here. We do okay. some new construction and, and stuff here. In Ontario, we only do retrofit specialty new construction for like a data center. 90% of our work is direct to owner, no GCs or construction managers in between. So we're doing $20 million retrofits and upgrades and courthouses and that that are heavy mechanical. And we are the GC instead of working for a GC because it's mostly us. So our theory is always why, why would we work for a general contractor when we're the biggest chunk of the work? You're just taking our price and marking it up. Mm-hmm. So we've kind of built a, a niche market there, but you want to build a new building from scratch, like that's what GCs are for. But you right. got this complex mechanical stuff with a bunch of civil excavating, maybe a roof replacement, things like that. But it's mostly mechanical, 50 percent or more mechanical. Like that's the stuff we want. Yeah, yeah. Give me the good stuff. So our models are slightly different between the two provinces. You have to one of the things of learning multiple provinces, the general structure and how we operate as a company works in both provinces, but it doesn't, you can't exactly replicate. Like there are little differences between the operations, the type of work, how you operate and how you do those things. That's part of that learning process when you come out here is learning, you know, it's almost like a different country in that sense, like business is done slightly differently. It's like and another universe here it, most yeah. of the time. Yeah. <laughs> and then you want a real another like Cape Breton, different, that's like a different country. Oh, so we, we class that as, <laughs> yes. as a different era. Um, I, yeah. so you, if, you win if this everybody like, in Cape Breton says, I'm from Cape Breton, I'm not from Nova Scotia. Yes. You're right. That's true. They, they do. You, you yeah. Every one of them. And we are like the big city. This is like New York City. Down Center here. of the universe, baby. Um, so you win this huge project. Yep. I, I want to touch on this tax issue as, as, our, as, our, as we almost approach time here. So you purchase a property uh, in the Sydney area. Yep. And what happens? So I don't think anybody thought about this, the real estate agent, anyone leading up to it, because I didn't have this issue in 2022. Turns out I bought the condo a month before this came in. Who knew? So wow. to me, yeah. didn't know any of this. Mm-hmm. It was a good bird sound effect. I like that. Um, so we get the place and nobody thinks to say anything to me. And then we're getting putting the closing papers in, got the lawyers here working on it. Um, and they go, hey, do you meet this definition by chance? Like, are you Nova Scotia Control Corporation? Nope. Are you a you know, resident? No. Are half your directors from Nova Scotia? No. Are half the shares owned by Nova Scotia? No. Okay, so you are a non-resident. I'm like, I could have told you that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. What does that mean? Five uh, percent tax. I'm like, okay. Thirty-three thousand dollars extra. Ooh. And look at what you're bringing to the province. Which so is yeah. that was my upset with it is you know we we just bought a building here in in Burnside that my trusty real estate advisor he said here's a building to buy. 
and we walked through it, and I went. You're welcome. You didn't even go to the walkthrough with me. You actually just sent me to go meet. Where was I? Was I, was I wasn't here. He's, was yeah. I? Was oh, I was at home in bed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you flying your plane. He, he sends me in to go see some other real estate agent. Just lets me go. Right. Yeah. Boom. And I went in the wild. And, and I walked out. And I walked out with um, good guy. He's not bad. He's a pretty good guy. Walked out, and I looked at our GM, and I said, "This building is so shitty." It just might work. You called me. You said it's so shitty. I love it. Yeah. Wow. Let's put an offer in. So we did that. And you, you, you so that was that's part of my gripe is we, we. So right now we have a staff of about thirty people out here, and between Halifax, Cape Breton, we're expanding the office. We just bought this new building. Um, we're going from twenty five hundred square feet to ten thousand square feet. We're doing a multi million dollar renovation to the building. Very nice. We're trying to grow the business, and so although I'm not from Nova Scotia, we're not a Nova Scotia business. I feel. We're contributing to the economy. We're driving things. We're not just coming in from the outside and buying, which I understand the purpose of the tax, but why am I getting hit with this when we're actually helping to drive business, build critical infrastructure, help the healthcare, and employ Nova Scotians? We pay a lot of tax here. And when we're investing locally, why am I getting hit with this? Because I, I, I'm a part-time resident here. Um, and James has been very helpful in helping me track down some contacts to plead my case. And we are in the process of seeing if uh, they agree. They actually did agree that they need to look at their legislation. There's been a few gray areas throughout this. Um, but James was absolutely instrumental in getting me some contacts. Wait till you get the invoice. No, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no invoice for this. It's always a secret only, James. I'm yeah, kidding. that's, I'm kidding. that's, I'm kidding. that's always fine. Always an ulterior motive. If I have to give you a 5%, like if I can get the 33 grand back, I'll happily give you 5% of that. Oh, no. I, I, here. I just just buy me a pint. Here, We're good. Writing. The Nova Scotia yeah. way. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that's an important uh, plea here to make to the province is, you know, yes, make I it see friendly to do business here. Yeah, I see Don't the penalize behind, the people that want to invest here. I the tax, but not in your case. No, if you're taking homes away, and we bought this home so we can move some staff in because they need the extra support in that, so we could relocate staff to help build this hospital. It wasn't just to take away homes or to rent Airbnbs out and actually take homes away from Nova Scotians. It's to help build the infrastructure. So I understand why it's there, but I don't think I was the intended target. And un unfortunately, fell consequence to it. Nobody thought about it because I think with the setup, with everything we're doing here, nobody thought until we got to closing to go, hey, you're going to have to pay this tax. I yeah. Otherwise, I would have tried to find a cheaper house because mm -hmm. these guys got a great spot. It's on the ocean. They overlook the Sydney Harbor. It's beautiful. So... Now you've seen both sides of it. You've, you know, sometimes lived here. You've worked here. You've done business here and in Ontario. Um, you know, what is one thing you? What's one word, one sentence you use to describe how you like Nova Scotia and, and uh, you know, what it means to you and your company? One sentence. There's more. That's good. Oh, yeah. That's what we like to. No, hear. it could contain as many words uh, as yeah, you need it to. Just, yeah, oh, just, run on. Just <laughs> run on sentence. Okay. Just, pretend this is no pretend periods. This is Facebook. Honestly, no periods. It's such a beautiful province and I think a lot of people don't understand everybody thinks of the west coast traditionally and like I said I had never been out here mm -hmm. um I think it's it's underrated and a lot of people started finding it during COVID because of housing and affordability but just how beautiful it is the diverse landscape how nice it is it's a different pace of life out here even um, the conversations you can have with other people in your industry how it works it, it's just completely different here um it is tough to get to break in and become local and, and, and be, become part of it and my wife never understood when I said, I want to move here. Mm -hmm. And she goes, mm -hmm. I don't know. And then we got the condo and she started coming here. And then she's like, literally, I think it was after the second time we came here. She goes, I get it. Yeah. And I was like, ah. Yeah. So, you know, um, the goal would be definitely uh, one day I'd, if I could find a way to live here, I would love to would love to do that. Unfortunately, up until recently, 90% of our business was in Ontario. I, we said originally, if you rewind, boop. We wanted to do three to five million a year. The last few years, we were pushing seven to ten, and now obviously we're going to probably push that into the twenty-five plus million a year for the next few years. So, very nice. um, it's it, it's been a, the province has been very good to us, um, and it's nice to be able to try and it's it's nice having an impact somewhere else where we're employing families and actually making a difference too on the economy, the local uh, the local economy, trying to re, you know build and fix up buildings and reinvest here as well. Um, and it's been a it's been a fun stressful learning learning curve. Brandon, look, hey, so thank you for joining us and give our best to Janice back home. Uh, and and please do move here full time when you can. And please invite we want me you. next time, you guys. We're on a better up. track. Oh, we we'll invite you next time. Right? Please invite me. I I'll take you some cool spots. Maybe you haven't been to. And maybe we should just put my email out there and see if anybody any of your listeners want to come drink with us too. Let's just bring as many as we can. Yeah, let's see how many people we can get. <laughs> the, we'll the we'll do open Q and A for drinks. Just one big flock. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Matter of Facts podcast. But you can get more of us. You can subscribe on any good podcast provider. You can follow us on Instagram at Matter of Facts Podcast. And for all that great feedback and abuse, you can send it by email to halifaxpodcast at gmail.com. 
And of course, you can always find James Collins and I on the internet. Please do get in touch, and we look forward to seeing you next time. 